I wish you to be the leader of the world. Being the leader of the world means to be the leader of peace. Ukrainian, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky makes an impassioned plea to the U.S. Congress and President Biden to do more to help his people. Hello there, I'm Mike Walter, and this is The Heat. The Ukrainian president received a standing ovation from members of the U.S. Congress as he made a direct appeal to the United States for additional aid, weapons and sanctions against Russia to defend his country. In response, U.S. President Joe Biden announced an additional $800 million in military support for Ukraine. CGTN's White House correspondent Nathan King is joining us now. Nathan, uh, President Zelensky is still pushing for a no-fly zone. What was the U.S. response to that? Well, an amazing, emphatic uh, a, a plea here in uh, front of all the congressmen of the United States and women. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, whoever's writing his speeches knows uh, he can push uh, national buttons, whether it was in the British Parliament, uh, or the Canadian Parliament uh, in the last 24 hours and here as well, invoking the national myths of America. He basically said, protect our skies. So let's take a listen. Remember September the 11th, a terrible day in 20, 2001 when evil tried to turn your cities, independent territories, in battlefields, when innocent people were attacked, attacked from air. Yes, just like no one else expected it. You could not stop it. Our country experience the same every day. Right now, at this moment, every night, for three weeks now, various Ukrainian cities, Odessa and Kharkiv, Chernihiv and Sumy, Zhytomyr and Lviv, Mariupol and Dnipro, Russia has turned the Ukrainian sky into a source of death for thousands of people. And basically, he went on to say, look, no-fly zone, which of course would mean uh, NATO or U.S. planes taking out Russian air defenses and potentially shooting down Russian planes. Uh, Joe Biden has said no to that, but he gave some wiggle room. He said, look, if you can't give us that, perhaps a humanitarian no-fly zone, uh, perhaps based in the west of the country, we understand, near uh, Lviv, for example, to allow uh, refugees and, and aid to come in. Also, he asked, perhaps then, if you can't even do that, uh, air defenses like the S-300 uh, anti-air defense system, a Soviet system that some NATO countries have. But given the uh, debate over whether Poland can supply uh, Ukraine with MiG uh, fighters and the opposition from Washington, that is not necessarily clear. Uh, but as you said at the outset, Joe Biden responded almost immediately saying, look, on top of the $14 billion of aid that just passed Congress in the spending bill, we're giving you another $800 million. And a lot of it is based on those sort of anti-air things that they're asking for. Uh, missiles, for example, that can be launched uh, from the ground or from shoulders uh, to basically try and bring down aircraft. Because even though there have been some successes by the Ukrainian Air Force, the Russian Air Force actually dominates now more Ukrainian skies than it did at the outset of the war. Mike. Nathan King at the Capitol Force, thanks so much. For more on the Russia-Ukraine conflict, let's bring in our panel. Joining us from New York is Aaron Mate. He's the host of Pushback with Aaron Mate on the Gray Zone. And here in Washington, D.C. is Anton Fidyashin. He's a Russian affairs analyst and professor of history at American University. Anton, let's start with you. Uh, the speech at one point, uh, Zelensky addressing the U.S. Congress in English. Let's listen to a little bit of that. Peace in your country doesn't depend anymore only on you and your people. It depends on those next to you, on those who are strong. Strong doesn't mean weak. Strong is brave and ready to fight for the life of his citizens and citizens of the world, for human rights, for freedom, for the right to live decently, and to die when your time comes and not when it's wanted by someone else. 
by your neighbor. Anton, he seemed to win over uh, members of Congress, but I want to get your feel for how the Kremlin's going to view this speech. Well, I think they're going to view it the same way that they viewed the speech to the Canadians yesterday and then to the Brits a few days ago. Um, <clears throat> from the Kremlin's perspective, a no-fly zone is uh, unacceptable, uh, and it will threaten a direct conflict between NATO and Russia, exactly what NATO also believes, exactly, by the way, what Western governments that Zygemsky has appealed to in the past few days believe. So it was an impassioned uh, appeal. Uh, it is uh, an attempt to put rhetorical pressure or on Ottawa, on London, most importantly, of course, on Washington. But so far, uh, none of this has uh, worked. And even among congressmen, there are still profound divisions about uh, the no-fly zone. Many uh, are not willing to take that step. And even about the uh, degree of other support for Ukraine, especially in terms of air defense uh, weapons. Um, uh, Zelensky is doing the best that he can, but so far, uh, what he's really after, he's not going to get from the West. Aaron, it's interesting, former Defense Secretary Leon Panetta uh, described him this week as probably the most powerful lobbyist in the world right now. He's also a polished TV presenter, as, as we well know, and, and you saw that today. It wasn't just an impassioned speech. He, he weaved in this video essay as well, um, but he was also kind of in your face. You've got to implement this no-fly zone, uh, directly challenging Biden to be the leader of the world. What did you make of this presentation? Well, I think Leon Panetta's comment that Zelensky is a lobbyist is very apt because the only people who will benefit from Zelensky's PR campaign are arms manufacturers in Washington and Virginia who spend a lot of money uh, on lobbyists to drum up the kind of support for the policies that Zelensky wants, which essentially is World War III. Let's be honest. That's what a no-fly zone would mean. And missing from this entire conversation, and I understand Zelensky, the position he's in, his country is being attacked. It's understandable why he would feel compelled to ask for more support to help him out. That's understandable. But this conversation ignores that there are solutions on the table that could resolve all of this. And actually, they've been on the table for a very, very long time. There's been a war going on in Ukraine for the last eight years. It began with a U.S.-backed coup in 2014. The coup government has essentially waged war on the Russian-speaking population, some of whom rose up to defend themselves. And the U.S., instead of pushing its client in Ukraine to implement the only peace accords on the books between both sides, called the Minsk Accords, the U.S. has been fueling this proxy war with billions of dollars in weapons. And then when Russia asked for those accords to be respected, along with Ukraine to enshrine in its constitution some neutrality, the U.S. refused. And that's when Russia invaded. And Russia's demands remain the same. And Whatever you think about Russia's decision to invade, and I think it was a criminal decision, the fact is Russia's proposals before the war were sensible. It makes sense that a state on Russia's borders should not be used as cannon fodder and as a NATO proxy, because conflict between these countries literally could lead to nuclear war if Ukraine is inside of NATO. So those solutions are on the table. And I think if Zelensky was really serious about peace, he would immediately be uh, negotiating seriously over Russia's demands and not trying to fuel the conflict further and escalate it longer with demands that essentially amount to World War III. Anton, uh, Aaron's uh, talking about lobbying and the effectiveness of it. Uh, we saw today he, he authorized another $800 million so far. The administration's authorized $2 billion for Ukraine ever since the Biden administration came into power. But there's these headlines in the Western media in just the last few weeks. I grabbed just a couple. Uh, America could have done even more to protect Ukraine. Uh, that was just about three weeks ago. And then this one, the U.S. can still help Ukraine without starting World War War III, um, are, the, are these headlines right? I mean, should the U.S. be doing more or should they take their foot off the gas pedal? Well, look, it depends on what more uh, and what the doing uh, is. Uh, diplomatically, of course, uh, the chance to prevent this catastrophe that the Kremlin visited on Ukraine um, was missed uh, in December, in January, in the first 
uh, part of February, despite, by the way, the German chancellors and the French president's uh, shuttle diplomacy as they were bouncing around between Moscow, Kiev, uh, Brussels, and their respective uh, capitals. Uh, let's not forget about the uh, European, Western European push to try to settle this. Um, we're beyond uh, all of that, of course. But um, my suspicion, and this is the pessimist in me, is that um, neither Russia nor especially Ukraine is uh, going to withstand this for much longer. Ukraine, of course, has even more to lose than Russia because the war is going on on its territory. And we, end, we may see the peace negotiations, the final deal, which, of course, eventually will come out of this conflict that will resemble um, very closely the Minsk II agreement with things added to it um, and the tragedies that all the lives will be lost. And then Zelensky uh, will have to uh, mount an even bigger lobbying campaign in the West in order to raise the funds to rebuild the Ukrainian economy. Ukraine was already the poorest country in Europe before the conflict began, and it will come out of this conflict in even more dire economic straits than it was in February before this began. And unfortunately, we know from wars of the past that the West and the United States uh, unfortunately often lose interest in the countries where wars take place and people's attention is uh, uh, distracted by other things. It's interesting, Anton. I was talking to a woman diplomat here in Washington just the other day, and she said there's two things missing uh, from the landscape right now. One is a woman, and the other is an off-ramp. And she said, you know, if a woman was involved in these talks, it wouldn't be all this bravado and this tough talk. And we're seeing that from Putin and Biden and, and of course, Zelensky. Zelensky say, saying today, strong doesn't mean weak. Strong is brave, ready to fight. Uh, we've heard it from all of them. Uh, Biden even today calling Putin a, a war criminal. This, this diplomat said that red-hot rhetoric is preventing an off-ramp, and that's what you need to save lives. Um, do you agree? No, I do agree. Uh, but this is what happens during uh, uh, an information war, which also always accompanies uh, every single war. And I've, we've all, those of us talking here, have already lived through a whole set of them just in the 20. Um, first century, uh, yes, this is true. Nonetheless, the remarkable thing is that judging by the leaks or, you know, controlled release of information from the Ukrainian and Russian side uh, that are negotiating, they are making tentative uh, progress. And that's the only thing that keeps me optimistic about the fact that this will uh, eventually come to an end. But all sides are going to have to uh, give up more rather than less. Unfortunately, the Ukrainians, I'm afraid, will have to give up uh, more because NATO's not coming in on their side, even with a fly zone, even with a humanitarian one, which would have meant a, a no-fly zone anyway. And even their bid to join the EU after a few loud declarations in the beginning, this was last week or the week before last, that's also sort of stalled as the EU is not exactly willing to take the Ukrainians in. And so they will be left to pick up the pieces and to hope that both the Russians, by the way, who are responsible for a lot of the destruction, but also the EU and perhaps the U.S. will turn military aid into badly, vitally needed economic aid. We'll see uh, what happens. But that's going to be Zelensky's next Sisyphean task. And Aaron, uh, it's interesting in his speech, he called for a new alliance to help end global conflicts. Let's watch an excerpt from his uh, address. The war of the past have prompted our predecessors to create institutions that should protect us from war. But they unfortunately don't work. We see it, you see it, so we need new ones, new institutions, new alliances, and we offer them. We propose to create an association, U24, United for Peace, a union of responsible countries that have the strength and cons consciousness to stop conflicts immediately. So, Aaron, it seemed like a, a swipe at NATO, at the UN. Uh, what do you make of this new institution he's talking about? Well, it depends who gets to join. If it's just another repeat of what NATO is, which is essentially a hostile military alliance that exists to create enemies like Russia, 
then it won't fly. Uh, recall that Russia, including under Putin, asked to join NATO. They wanted to be a part of a common European security architecture. Uh, Putin says that, according to uh, his, according to Putin, that Bill Clinton, when he when Putin raised this, that Bill Clinton essentially laughed that idea away, because NATO exists to uh, basically. Uh, manage risks that are created by its own existence, to quote the scholar Richard Sakwa. And that's why NATO has been used to destroy Libya. That's why it was uh, destroyed to uh, attack Yugoslavia. Not because those countries were attacking any member of NATO, but because NATO is by in itself a hostile military alliance. And so they need Russia, essentially, to justify their existence and justify all the billions and trillions of dollars that go into spending the weapon systems that, that keep it alive. So. If Zelensky is calling for basically just NATO under a different name, it will continue to lead to catastrophes like this. And, and uh, Anton, uh, I want to get your thoughts on that briefly, if you can, and also the contours of this uh, peace deal. Uh, how do you see it kind of coming into shape, and, and how soon do you think before we see something like that? Mike, um, there are already, already international organizations that are uh, dedicated to this end. The UN is one of them. The OSCE, which was created in Helsinki in 1975, is another one. And that one includes the entire um, Euro-Atlantic uh, space, including uh, Russia. Um, I don't know what Zelensky has in mind exactly. Reinvigorating the OSCE, which had uh, a special monitoring mission that was recording what was happening in the Donbass for the past, uh, and reliably so, over the past eight years. Reinvigorating the OSCE uh, sounds like uh, as good a way to go about this as, uh, as possible. I'm not sure where he got the number 24, but if this is an attempt uh, to not include Russia in it, then we're going to be running through the exact same cycle all over again in 10, 15, 20 uh, years. But if he is talking about a new OSCE, OSCE conference, the kind that we saw create um, uh, the OSCE in 1975, that is actually a very good idea because an international conference that addresses all of the issues that the OSCE addressed uh, 50 odd years ago, this could be one of the ways uh, out of this catastrophe. And then uh, to the point of a possible peace deal, how, how likely is that to happen anytime soon, do you think? Do you see any hope there on the horizon? We've got about 45 seconds left. I, I do see hope on the horizon, Mike, but um, war is such a profoundly contingent and unpredictable uh, phenomenon that I, there, no one can possibly predict uh, how, when this will happen. But the fact that they're actually sitting down uh, and on a daily basis discussing things, as opposed to meeting in Belarus where one delegation is late, the other one sitting around waiting, this is a very good sign. So I'm, I'm hopeful that in the next two, three weeks maybe, uh, we'll see a breakthrough. All right. Uh, my thanks to our guests, Anton and Aaron, for a great discussion. More than 3 million Ukrainians have fled the country, according to the U.N. Refugee Agency. It is the fastest growing refugee crisis in Europe since World War II. The United States has pledged its support and has said it is willing to take in more refugees. But last week, a Ukrainian mother and her three children were turned away at the U.S.-Mexico border. Because actually I have uh, family and uh, friends in USA and they are ready to support me. And uh, actually they asked me to leave Ukraine in this situation. In any other case I wouldn't leave, I am I, I, sure, because I have uh, more family and friends over there. The mother and her children were eventually allowed to enter the United States under a humanitarian exemption. But what's the fate for other Ukrainians trying to enter the United States? And why is the U.S. southern border still closed to asylum seekers? For some answers, let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Washington, D.C. is Rafael Bernal. He's a reporter for the political newspaper The Hill. And Lode George is a senior attorney with the Garfield Law Group specializing in immigration law. And Lode, why don't I start with you? This uh, conflict uh, in Ukraine, we're looking at uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 3 million refugees have fled the country, uh, according to the United Nations. Uh, the majority, of course, hope to return to their country, but obviously some will probably be coming here to the United States. It's not as easy as going to the airport and jumping on a plane, though. Can you walk us through the process? Well, it absolutely depends on the path that they get to the United States. If they're still stuck in the Ukraine, the options are very limited. It includes attempting to apply for visas. The most common route right now is a visitor visa, but that does include you being able to access 
a U.S. embassy that's open to you, and for obvious reasons, the U.S. embassy in the Ukraine right now is not open. The U.S. embassies in the countries immediately outside of the Ukraine have been inundated, um, understandably so, with people attempting to apply for visitor visas. But then the burden shifts to the applicant to prove that they only want to come to the United States temporarily. And because these visas, excuse me, because these embassies are so inundated, the uh, wait for an interview to even make your case to say, hey, I want to come into the U.S. for temporary refuge is limited to um, not the immediate future, let me put it that way. We're talking weeks, if not months. Um, so that's one way. The other way is to get to an embassy that's further out or getting um, yourself on a plane and to a U.S. border where you would have the option of asking a customs agent to let you cross. And as you just discussed, that's not always an option, especially if you're coming in through the U.S.-Mexico border, where you've got ind individuals from all across the world, um, from that region, Central America to be exact, but also you've got um, refugees from other parts of the world that also go through the Mexico route and in hopes of hopefully being able to ask for asylum. And because of Title 42, we're seeing that that's not an option that's always available. And so we're not seeing any path, any clean, clear, open path that says, hey, Ukrainians, come in, we've got you. That's just not the way that the laws are written right now. Uh, Raphael, we've known for some time that there's been an immigration issue here in the United States. And uh, adding to that, about 85,000 Afghans have been uh, relocated to the United States in the last six months. Is there an appetite for the same sort of thing with uh, Ukrainians trying to flee their country? Well, I would say there's probably more of a public appetite, uh, more of a public empathy toward Ukrainians than, for instance, um, Cameroonians, who you'll find uh, many of them, possibly in the thousands, also in, in, in a similar situation, uh, crossing through Mexico, trying to apply for asylum. But what, what we're seeing is, is how the asylum and refugee process have been sort of gutted, and they're not working as they should be. Title 42, many, many immigrant advocates are incredibly critical of Title 42 because it's implementing, uh, you know, a pandemic response to an issue that hasn't been, um, you know, we, we haven't seen migrants being a source of, of large-scale coronavirus contagion. So it seems, it seems a little bit unfair, and that's, and that's what the uh, advocates are saying. And, and just frankly, the United States doesn't seem to have the right tools to, to, to manage an ongoing crisis. Uh, both Afghans and, and Ukrainians already in the country have a temporary protected humanitarian status. Um, but, um, but, but that just that just helps the people who are already in the country, not so much people who might need protections uh, going forward. Rafael, uh, both of you mentioned Title 42. For our international audience, briefly, if you can, just describe what it is and why is it still in place? So it's a Trump era protection. Uh, let's, let's call it a border management policy where basically the United States reserved the right to immediately expel any foreign migrant crossing, crossing the borders uh, to, to protect against uh, you know, migrants bringing in more coronavirus. It was criticized at the time since coronavirus wasn't coming to the United States from the South. It was sort of going in the other direction. And it's been even more criticized of the Biden administration. And frankly, most advocates are baffled as to why it's still in place. The reality is probably that the Biden administration is afraid that immigration numbers are, are, are going to look bad for them politically. And Lode, uh, you know, the Biden administration uh, was ordered by the courts, though, to reinstate a uh, Trump-era border policy that forces asylum seekers to basically stay in Mexico until their U.S. immigration court dates. We know that there's a backlog there. Uh, describe for us that issue as well, because it seems like it takes forever to even get in front of a, a judge. There aren't enough judges. I mean, it's, the list is long, isn't it? Yeah, and as, as the other guest alluded to the fact that the system was absolutely gutted. So if you're looking at a system that's already crippled and you're then essentially removing the kneecaps. Um, you're really dealing with a situation where individuals are trying to get relief, but there is no structured system to do so. 
and whatever is on the ground is already backlogged and not properly supported. And so you're not having a situation where people are getting the help that they need, getting the hearings that they need, where they can present their claims of relief. And so if you're not even having your day in court, you're not then being able to establish your eligibility for asylum. And so the biggest issue here is not even being able to present why you should be, why you should be able to seek refuge in the United States. Rafael, we know the system is broken. Uh, you've talked about that on our program many times. You also talked about the political dimension of all of this. In a recent poll conducted by Impact Research, uh, which is a firm uh, basically founded by Joe Biden's chief political pollster, it finds about 66 percent of likely midterm voters disapproving of President Biden's handling of the immigration crisis. Does that handcuff the president in terms of trying to do anything about this issue? So I think most polls have shown that that Americans are more tired that nothing's happen, happening on immigration, whether they believe that, you know, restrictions should be tighter or looser. Uh, it's just it's just clearly a an issue, a large issue with the uh, which the U.S. government is failing to, to simply to manage. So. Uh, there's there's a there's a strain of thinking in Washington D.C. Put it that way, that that any action would be received positively by a majority of voters, and frankly, it's it's almost a lot of people are telling the White House to to take that mentality since inaction seems to be a political liability for any president on on immigration. Let's let's remember it. It's an issue that helped get Trump elected. But it also helped Trump have a very bad midterm. So it's it's like e complete restrictionism has not worked, and and flip flopping doesn't uh, doesn't seem to be doing the trick either. So Lodi, uh, as somebody who's very familiar with uh, this issue, what are if you had uh, the president's ears, what are some suggestions you'd make and and to members of Congress on how to try and address this issue? Well, let's be clear. I I, I would not put it all on Biden's shoulders because. At the end of the day, Congress has to be able to pass these laws. And this has happened time and time again over the last 20 plus years, where this hits the floor, it gets stalemated, and we don't move forward. And so, at the very least, I think it's a collective effort between the White House and Congress to actually make a concerted effort for comprehensive immigration reform, because what rules and laws that we have to work with now are just simply outdated. And we're seeing the crises of these outdated laws happening in real time as we speak. And so it's really an effort um, from the bottom up, or I should say from the top down. It's not really only on the president's shoulders. Congress has to understand that they've got to pass these laws. They have to work together. Bipartisanship, that's something he champions. Uh, we haven't seen much of it. I want to thank both of you for joining us. Really appreciate the discussion. And that's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Mike Walter in Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for watching.